Euzubillahimineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi şirah li sadri ve esirli emri ve lef kadar min lisani yevkavu kavli. Selamun aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve So we will continue with our discussion in the tenth word. We have a quiet a crowd here in Philly. Uh, so we will try a new voice maybe today to read. I don't know if I've heard of your Khan's voice. You keep hearing my voice <laughs> like constantly. It's like a biological constant oh. in the you know the evolutionary theory that it needs to be there, whatever state you. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we will continue with the uh, our discussion on tenth word, uh, which is on <clears throat> resurrection and hereafter, and uh, among the twelve truths. We are now studying the sixth truth. <laughs> Inshallah, we will continue from the sixth truth. The last week we studied the fifth, which was about the gate of, of compassion and worship, if I'm not mistaken. So with each truth, and we look at the universe, the creation around us from a different lens from a different gate, window, and each window corresponds to a different manifestation of the names of the creator. So one week we study uh, the justice as manifested in the creation, and to, from the justice in the creation, we know, we learn about the just one, the source of the justice. And another week we study uh, the wisdom in the creation. And uh, from the wisdom we experience in the creation, we know about the, the wise one, uh, so on and so forth. And through all these names, we study how they necessitate uh, the Resurrection hereafter. And today, inshallah, we uh, we will study the gate of splendor and eternity and the, the manifestation of the names of glorious, okay, uh, glorious Jalil and eternal Baki. Mm. Jalil and Baki. Okay. Uh, do you think Adam is old enough to read like an adult, an English text? What do you think? What do you think, Adam? <laughs> How old are you, Adam? 13? Yeah, you can read it on your sleeve. Would you go ahead? Start with the sixth truth. I will tell you when to stop so that your brother Atik can continue. Oh, I think do, do, do you mind helping him with the mic, like holding it or putting somewhere? Okay, should be good. Is it is it all is it at all possible that the splendor of Domin Take your time. Dominicality that subdues and commands all beings from suns and trees down to the part down to particles, just like obedient soldiers should concentrate its entire attention on the wretched and transcendent being transient being beings that pass a temporary life in the hospice of this world and not create an internal and everlasting sphere of splendor, an unending manifestation of domin dominicality. Dominicality. 
the display of divine splendor and the changing of seasons, the sublime motions of planets in the heavens as if they were airplanes, the subjugation of all things and the creation of all earth as man's cradle and the sun as his lamp. The vast transformations as the reviving and adornment, adornment of the dead and dry globe, all this shows that behind, uh, behind the veil, a sublime dominicality dem exists, that a splendid monarchy is at work. Now, such a dominical dominical kingdom requires subjects worthy of itself, as well as an appropriate mode of manifestation. But look at this hospice of the world, and you will see that mo the most significant class of its subjects, endowed with the most comprehensive of functions, are gathered together only temporarily, and that in the in the most wretched Wretched of states, wretched. wretched of states, the hospice fills and empties each day. All of the subjects stay only temporarily in this abode of trial for the sake of being tested in service. The abode itself changes each hour. Again, all the all of the monarch subjects stay only for a few brief minutes in order to behold the samples of the precious bounty of the glorious maker, to look on his miraculous works of art and the ex exhibition of the world with the hawk of a buyer. With the eye? With the eye of a buyer. Then they disappear. The exhibition itself changes every minute. Whoever leaves it never returns and whoever comes to it will ultimately depart. Now on this state, and the circumstance definitely shows that behind and beyond this hospice, this testing ground, this exhibition, there are permanent palaces and eternal abodes that are fully manifest and support God's everlasting sovereign, sovereign. Sovereign, sovereignty. There are gardens and treasure houses full of pure and exalted original f of the forms and copies we see in this world. If we strive here in this world, it is it is for the sake of what that of the, that of what that awaits us there. We work here and are rewarded there. Bliss awaits everyone there in accordance with his capacity. As long as he does not squander his share, yes, it is impossible that such such internal kingship should concentrate exclusive, exclusively on these wretched transient, transient beings. Consider this a true consider this truth through the telescope of the following comparison. You are traveling along a road. You see a caravanserai. caravanserai ahead of you on the on the road built on the road built by great by a great personage for people coming to visit him. Millions are spent on the decoration of the con Caravanserai, so guests, so that the guests in, should enjoy their time, should enjoy their one night stay there, and for their in, instructions. But the guests see very little of the decorations. Look at them for a very short time briefly tasting the joys of what is offered to them. They go their way without being satisfied. Satiated. Satiated. But each guest takes a photograph of the of the objects and the car 
caravan 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 Sarai by means of his special camera. Also, the servants of that great personage record with great care the conduct of all the guests and preserve the record. You see, too, that he destroys every day most of the valuable decorations and replaces them with fresh new, fresh decorations for the newly arriving guests. After seeing all this, will any doubt remain that the personage who has constructed constructed this caravanserai on the road has permanent and exalted dwellings inexhaustibly and precious treasures and an uninterrupted flow of great generosity by means of gener of the generosity displayed in the car caravanserai he he intends merely to whet the appetite of his guests for for those things he keeps in his immediate presence to awaken their desire for the gifts he had he has prepared for them so too so too if you look upon the state of hospice of this world without falling into drunkenness you will understand the following nine principles. Okay, I'll take over. <clears throat> take this. Hold it. First principle. You will understand that this world does not exist for its own sake any more than does the caravanserai. It is impossible that it should assume this shape by itself. Rather, it is a well-constructed hospice wisely designed to receive the caravan of beings that constantly arrive to alight before departing again. Second principle, you will understand too that those living within the, this hospice are guests. They are invited by their generous sustainer to the abode of peace. Third principle, <clears throat> You will understand further that the adornment of this world, adornments of this world are not simply for the sake of enjoyment or admiration, for if they yield pleasure for a time, they cause pain for a longer time with their cessation. They give you a taste and whet your appetite, but never satiate you, for either the life of the pleasure is short or your life is short too brief for you to become satiated. These adornments of high value and brief duration must then be for the sake of instruction and wisdom, for arousing gratitude and for encouraging men to seek out the perpetual or origin originals of which they are copies. They are then for other exalted goals beyond themselves. And we have a very long footnote. Now, now oh, this is the short footnote. Now the lifespan of everything is short. Although its value is high and the subtleties of its artistry are most exalted and beautiful. This implies that everything is only a sample, a form of something else, that it has the function of drawing the gaze of the customer to the authentic and original object. This being the case, it may be said that the variegated adornments of this world are the samples of the bounties of paradise prepared by the compassionate and merciful one for his beloved servants. Fourth principle, you will understand also that the adornments of this world are like samples and forms of the blessings stored up in paradise by the mercy of the compassionate one for the people of faith. Now we have the long footnote. <clears throat> there are numerous purposes for the existence of everything and numerous results flow from its being. These are not restricted to this world and to the souls of men as the people, as the people of misguidance imagine, being thus lost in vanity and purposeless. On the contrary, the, the purposes for the existence and the results of the beings of all things relate to the following three categories. The first and the most exalted 
pertains to the creator. It consists of presenting to the gaze of the pre-eternal witness the bejeweled and miraculous wonders he has affixed to the object in question as if in a military parade. To live for a fleeting second is enough to attain that glance. Indeed, the potentiality and intent for existence is enough without ever emerging into life. This purpose is fully realized, for example, by delicate creatures that vanish swiftly and by seeds and kernels, each a work of art that never come to life, that is never bear fruit or flower. They all remain untouched by vanity and purposelessness. Thus, the first purpose of all things is to proclaim by means of their life and existence the miracles of power and the traces of artistry of the maker and display them to the gaze of the glorious monarch. The second purpose of all existence and the result of all being pertains to conscious creation. Everything is like a truth displaying missive, an artistic poem or a wise word of the glorious maker offered to the gaze of angels and jinn of men and animals and desiring to be read by them. It is an object for the contemplation and instruction of every conscious being that looks upon it. The third purpose of all existence and result of all being pertains to the soul of the thing itself and consists of such minor consequences as the experience of pleasure and joy and living with some degree of permanence and comfort. If we consider the purpose of a servant employed as a steersman on some royal ship, we see that only one hundredth of that purpose relates to the steersman himself i.e. the wage he receives, 99 hundredths of the purpose relate to the king who owns the ship. A similar relation exists between the purpose of a thing related to its own self and its worldly existence, and its purpose related to its maker. In the light of this multiplicity of purposes, we can now explain the ultimate compatibility between divine wisdom and economy on one hand, and divine liberality and generosity and generosity. In fact, infinite generosity, on the other hand, even though they appear to be opposites and contradictory. <clears throat> In the individual purposes of things, liberality and generosity predominate and the name of most generous is manifested. From the point of view of individual purpose, Fruits and grains are indeed beyond computation, and they demonstrate inf infinite generosity. But in universal purposes, wisdom pre predominates, and the name of all wise is manifested. However many purposes a tree has, each of its fruits contains that many purposes, and these can be divided into three categories. Into three categories we have established the three categories we have established. Their universal purposes demonstrate an infinite wisdom and economy. Infinite wisdom and infinite generosity and liberality are thus combined despite their apparent opposition. For example, one of the purposes for raising an army is the maintenance of order. Whatever troops are available for the purpose will suffice or be more than enough. But the whole army will be barely enough for other purposes, such as protecting the nat national frontiers and repelling enemies. Its size will be in perfect balance with utter wisdom. Thus, the wisdom of the state will be joined to its splendor, and it can be said that there is no excess in the army. Fifth principle. You will understand, too, that all of these transient objects have not been created for the sake of annihilation in order to appear briefly and then vanish. The purpose for their creation is rather briefly to be assembled in existence and acquire the desired form so that these may be noted, their images preserved, their meetings known, and their results recorded. This is so that, for example, everlasting spectacles might be wrought for the people of eternity and that they might serve other purposes in the realm of it, eternity. You will understand that things have been created for eternity, not for annihilation, and as for apparent annihilation, it has sense. It has the sense of a completion of duty and a release from service for every transient thing advances to annihilation with one aspect, but remains eternally with numerous other aspects. 
Look, for example, at the flower, a word of God's power for a short time, it smiles and looks at us and then hides behind the veil of annihilation. It departs just like a word leaving your mouth, but it does so in trusting thousands of its fellows to men's ears. It leaves behind meanings in men's mind as numerous as those minds. The flower too, expressing its meaning and thus fulfilling its function, goes and departs, but it goes leaving its apparent form in the memory of everything that sees it, its inner essence in every seed. It is as if each memory and seed were a camera to record the adornment of the flower or a means for its perpetuation. If such be the case, with an object at the simplest level of life, it can be readily understood how closely tied to eternity is man, the highest form of life and the possessor of an eternal soul. Again, from the fact that the laws, each resembling a spirit according to which large flowering and fruit bearing plants are formed, and the representations of their forms are preserved and perpetuated in most regular fashion in tiny seeds throughout tempestuous changes. From this fact, it can be easily understood how closely tied and related to eternity is the spirit of man which possesses an extremely exalted and comprehensive nature, and which, although clothed in a body, is a conscious and luminous law issuing from the divine command. Sixth principle, you will also understand that man has not been left to graze at all, at will, with a halter loosely tied around his neck. On the contrary, the forms of all his deeds are recorded and registered, and the results of all his acts are preserved for the day when he shall be called to account. Seventh principle. You will understand further that the destruction visited upon the beautiful creatures of summer and spring in the autumn is not for the sake of annihilation. Instead, it is, it is a form of dismissal after the completion of service. It is also a form of emptying in order to clear a space for the new creation that is to come in the following spring, of preparing the ground and making ready for the beings that are to come and assume their functions. Finally, it is a form of divine warning to conscious beings to awake from the neglect, the neglect that causes them to forget their duties from the drunken torpor that causes them to forget their obligations of offering thanks. And the footnote says, yes, it is fitting that the fruits, flowers, and leaves on the tips and branches of a tree preceding from the treasures of sustenance provided by divine mercy should depart when they become old and their duties are at an end. Otherwise, the gate will remain closed to those that come after them and a barrier will be erected against the expansion of God's mercy and the services to be performed by their brethren, i.e. other members of the species. Moreover, with the passing of youth, they will become wretched and distraught. Spring is like a fruit-bearing tree that in turn is an indication of the plane of resurrection. Similarly, the world of humanity in every age is like a tree inviting contemplation. And the world as a whole is like an amazing tree, the fruits of which are dispatched to the market of the hereafter. Eighth principle, you will understand this too, that the eternal maker of this transient world has another everlasting world. It is to this that he urges and impels his servants. Ninth principle, you will understand also that so compassionate a being will bestow bestow upon his choice servants in that world such gifts as no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, nor has their image crossed the heart of any man. And this is a, a reference to a hadith as noted uh, in the footnote. And in this we believe. <laughs> Long read. Little bit, little bit. The first part was my oh my microphone is off. Okay. Oh, that was a long read. I was saying the first part was much better. Of course, when Adam was reading. I, I, I agree. The second part we have to, you know, listen. Bear with. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah. And they say the reading 
you know, the skills in America low, they should look at Adam. Mm. He single-handedly increases the average. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back and discuss, try to discuss the text as a whole. It will be hard. We read a lot. And for newcomers, uh, we are reading uh, the sixth truth. Uh, I'm trying to find the text, sorry. This is small. No. So just give me a second if you don't mind. Okay. Six truth. So this is the gate of splendor and eternity. Uh, by the way, we started at uh, when at seven, not seven fifteen. I apologize. So it means if you joined us at seven fifteen, we've been already reading. If you joined us after seven fifteen. We don't care about you, so you are late, so you should be punished anyway. But for those who joined us on time, I apologize. So the sixth truth, this is uh, the gate of splendor and eternity, <laughs> the name of names of glorious and eternal. Uh, so Jalil and Baki again. <laughs> and let's keep in mind that uh, we are studying what what is the big picture topic i think <laughs> the name the gates the, the with 10 words resurrection resurrection alhamdulillah i will make such pop quizzes now okay <laughs> going forward uh, if i see someone playing with kids or doing some other things <laughs> not related to the halaga i will you know just put this, this red light on them here. This is <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we are studying resurrection, and as I said at the very beginning, with every truth, we are trying to decide, see the signs of resurrection or the evidence for resurrection from a different lens. So here, for instance. Just just to give you the let's say the bigger picture, you know the uh, the, the scope of the text. Here in this sixth truth, what we do, we look at the creation, and with creation I mean what? I think would you like to help me? With creation, tell me in a way that even a let's say that's hypothetically speaking. 13 years old mm. person would understand oh. what I mean with the create when I say creation. I mean, anything and everything that we witness, yeah. you know, from your physical, physical created beings, the sun, the moon, the trees, the food we eat, food, you know, yeah. our conversation with our moms, people, yeah, people oh. everything. So we look at the creation. We look at our lives, and there, in the sixth truth, we see, at least this is the claim of the author, okay? Author says, wherever you look, you will see glory and eternity. From the, your life, you will realize that the glory and eternity there, and by coming to such a conclusion that, oh, wherever I look, there is eternity. Wherever I look, there is, there's, let's say, let's put it that way, that wherever I look, there are signs of eternity. Wherever I look, there are signs of glory. And these signs tell me that there must be hereafter, there must be resurrection. Okay? So that's what we study here. But when we look at the text, so Adam would know it better because he read it very, you know, 
in a phase that we can understand slowly. Alhamdulillah. Uh, very clearly. So, author is talking about eternity at the, in the title, but then he's giving all these examples of transience, meaning everything being temporary. It's being there for a moment and not there next moment. So, for instance, we look at a flower, right? A beautiful flower in the springtime, let's say in April. All these shiny colors, beautiful colors. And then next day we go to the same spot and the flower is dead. Mm. It's not there anymore. Right? Sometimes we, you know, we talk with our mothers, our mothers, our mother tell us, tells us how, how much she loves, loves you. She says, you know, oh, Adam, I love you. You are my only, you know, the clever, beautiful child, she says. But the next day, she's a completely different person. She's like, she's hating you. She says, no, you cannot go outside. You cannot play this game. So this love is there for a moment. It's not there anymore in the next day. Or you like a video game, right? You like playing with it endlessly, like it, without no break or anything for 13 days, two weeks. You just, you know, give a break for drinking and eating a few things. And you play it, play it, play it. But after two weeks, you don't like it anymore. Things are temporary, like nothing is permanent. But author says all these temporary things which come and go, they actually tell us about eternity. That's the interesting thing, I believe. So let's start from there. Any comments, any questions, any suggestions how we should start? What, please? Well, maybe we can start from that uh, example, like the comparison that he gave. Uh, was, which example? The flower example or the, uh, no, the hostel? The, the caravansaray. Caravansaray. Well. Okay. Because it looks like uh, this is the uh, what is said before is being exemplified in here, and what comes after is being yep. built on top of that. So uh, this is at page eighty-six. I can read it with my uh, unpleasant reading. Yeah. Try to. Imitate Adam as much as you can. Okay, inshallah. Well, instead of caravansaray, can you say something like a hotel or a hotel? Okay, okay. It's really <laughs> like it doesn't ring any bell. Yeah, caravansaray is from Ertugul, you remember? <laughs> so that place that they used to stay, this is called caravansaray. Oh. Okay. Or maybe a visitor center would be a better one. Okay. Like an interstate travel, there are visitor centers. Okay. Rest area. Rest area, Rest yeah. area, okay. Rest area, cool. Okay, so consider this truth through the telescope of the following comparison. You are traveling along a road. You see a rest area ahead of you on the road built by a great personage for people coming to visit him. Millions are spent on the decoration of the rest area so that guests should enjoy their one night's stay there and for their instruction. But the guests see very little of those decorations. Look at them for a very short time, briefly tasting the joys of what is offered them. They go on their way without being sat satiated. But each guest takes a photograph of the objects in the rest area by means, by means of his special camera. 
Also, the servants of that great personage record with great care the conduct of all the guests and preserve the record. You see, too, that he destroys everything, like the uh, great personage, destroys everything, most of the valuable decorations, and replaces them with fresh decorations for the newly arriving guests. After seeing all this, will any doubt remain that the personage, like the great person, who has constructed this rest area on the road has permanent and exalted dwellings, inexhaustible and precious treasuries, and uninterrupted flow of great generosity. By means of the generosity displayed in the rest area, he intends merely to whet the appetite of his guests for those things he keeps in his immediate presence. Adam, do you know what wetting appetite means? Uh, no. No. Uh, what does it mean? No. I think wet appetite. Mm, well, appetite is like having a desire or hunger, and wetting is fulfilling that desire. So, if someone wanted a cheeseburger, you can wet their appetite by giving them a cheeseburger or something like that, fulfilling their desires. So, oh, like in the context, it's more like like you ask for cheeseburger. And somebody give you a sample from cheeseburger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not the entire cheeseburger. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like you know, you go to a, a super uh, a sample, uh, like a what, what is it called? Grocery. Place a grocery store mm -hmm. or like a place like a Costco. They have these samples yeah. to whet your appetite. You yeah. try try them, and you want to buy. You know, the, the actual thing. Kind of yeah, 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 yeah. Temporary uh, fulfillment of the appetite. Yeah. Yeah. Like stimulating. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. 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 I don't know if they still have it, but back in the day, there used to be demos of computer games, like oh. four minutes of play. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They still do. <laughs> they still have it? Oh, they they do. Do. There used to be FIFA 98 and... Uh, there was a limit. You can play only for two minutes. Uh -huh. Like each break, each half of the break was two minutes. So in, in total, you were able to play for four minutes. Wow. So this was for that it whets my appetite to buy the original game, right? This was the idea. Yeah. You mean you played with 1998? Yes. Wow. Back then. You are old, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so by means of generosity displayed in the rest area, he intends merely to whet the appetite of his guests for those things he keeps in his immediate presence, to awaken their desire for the gifts he has prepared for them. So this was the story. So just to paraphrase the story in a nutshell, the idea is, there's this rest place, but it's we see that it's like five star sort of a rest place, uh, rest rest area, and people in their journey to a destination come and stop in this rest area for a single night, but it's five star, they're perfectly taken care of, and every night bed sheets food everything is being renewed. Even the decorations. Decorations, everything is being renewed. That much of a five star or seven star, let's say, comfort is in this. Dubai rest. level. <laughs> Dubai level. Dubai. <laughs> so, but uh, the people who come to there only stays for one night. But the decorations are, if they were to stay there for maybe 100 years, they would barely be able to read all those or benefit from all those decorations, but they stay there only for one night. But in the meantime, they take pictures with their own camera, the visitors of what's going on in here, but then they go away. And also the officials of the uh, host, let's say the king, is also recording what those people did when they are in the rest place. Okay, so this is the setup. So what does this mean? Author is saying that by looking at this picture, you will understand that the king is wetting the appetite of the visitors. He just gives them some samples for like two minutes of computer gameplay, sort of. 
because he has the full full version. Mm -hmm. Like he gives them whatever in this rest area for one night. He has the original resources in his own palace, and he's just inviting them for that, wetting their appetite. So you will understand this from here. Uh, and also there was this detail, visitors are recording what they see there, plus officials of the king is also recording what the visitors did. So these are the two things. And then what uh, I think the main point was, this is a transient place. This is a trans interesting place because transient means temporary. So they stay there only for one night, but it points to an eternal king and kingdom existing. By looking at how uh, decorations change and how things are being recorded, you would say that, oh, there must be an eternal kingdom and people in this resting place are invited to that. So this is the whole idea, I think. And then the author will say, as in this story, if without being drunken, if you look at this earth that we live in as a rest area, you will realize those nine points. So well, I guess the first thing you will realize, he says, you will realize that your life is like in this example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess the first question can be, is this world the rest area? What do you feel like? Is, is the story fitting our reality? <laughs> the first new generation that I, uh, you know, experienced was my nephew. Mm -hmm. uh, up until my nephew was born, uh, 18 years ago, uh, like I, I was the, uh, uh, what is it called? Like the point of focal. focal point of attention, right? Uh, I mean, myself, my s sisters, my brother and so on, but we were the, the, the people who needs attention, who need attention and receive attention. But when was my nephew was born, he was the new generation for my family. And I realized very quickly that now he was the center of attention. And then my niece and other niece and so on. So the attention was not on me anymore. And I realized that, you know, our time has passed. So you're passing, right? It's coming to end. So it's like a, you, there's a play. This word is like a, a, a theatrical, you know, the play. You take your part. You, you know, to say whatever you need to say. And then once your scene ends, there are other people will fill the uh, you know, new scene, the stage. So my time has passed. Now it was their time. And now I have my child. It's even more pronounced now. When I think about the future, it is not my future anymore. It's her future. Right? Before I was worried about my future, but now I'm worried about her future because the future belongs to her, not to me. Uh, so when you look at that way, I guess it's so easy to realize that, you know, I'm just a guest. I will spend a night on this earth and then go. And somebody else will come and stay in the same room like a rest area, or sitting on the same desk, eating some food, table. So we are like guests, for sure.
So Adam thinks, you know, he's the youngest. He's the, you know, the most precious of the family. Just wait until, you know, your brothers, sisters, and uh, children, like the grandchildren for your mom and your father. Or wait until you get your own children. And you will realize that, you know, it's just a temporary life that you have. Any other comments about this example? Like there's a resting stay, a place that people visited very, for a very short time. And how about all these glorious decorations that being constantly changed, renewed? So uh, I'll take it to the very beginning for a brief second. The author in there was mentioning uh, that the creator has created this uh, earth is a cradle oh you mean beginning of the text not the example yes sun is a lamp so actually Quran is attracting our attention to look at the world as a guest area or a, as a rest area this is how Quran is introducing uh, this world and would like us to look at it from that perspective because uh, earth being a cradle means as if from your like baby age you are being carefully uh, put into sleep on this earth and then sun being a lamp means uh, as if again in a rest area brightest powerful nice lamps are put in this rest area so uh, this way of a perspective, Quran teaches to or suggests us to look at it from that, that view. And if I listen to Quran and say, well, is it really so? Then I will realize it really is so. And especially in terms of the length of this life, especially relative to the life of this rest area, like the earth, however many millions of years of age the earth is 6 to 7 years of life is really one night stay it's not that long of a thing and in the 6 years of life what do you do if I ask Atik what are you he would say I'm an environmental engineer so he is only reading one por portion of the uh, only one fraction of what beauties are written in this earth? If I ask Birkan, what are you? He would say, I am a something, something, something engineer. <laughs> so some, some sort of a computational engineer. And uh, he is only reading again a fraction of what is written in this uh, guest house. And not even like I think is not reading the uh, whole environmental engineering in its entirety, just a fraction of even that portion of it. But it's all written to minute details. So really, we are reading a fraction of this uh, very careful, uh, beautiful inscriptions. Then what, what is the point of writing that much? And then the, the other part that's interesting is, and I think we referred to it in, I might have referred to it in this discussion or another one, so I will repeat with your permission. So uh, a friend of ours, like the biologist friend, he used to say that it was very interesting that uh, human memories are being dumped into earth. Like they are not being inherited except writing on a paper. Like for example, bees or uh, animals, cows and whatnot, whatever they are good about, 
is genetically encoded and it gets tra transferred to the next generation. If milk is good in a cow, offsprings of that cow would have better milk, so on and so forth. But when it comes to scholarly work or your observations in this life, it just, whatever you learn, it goes into the earth, into the grave. So you become the, uh, the best video gamer or YouTuber, but your child has to start from the scratch. Yes. I mean, wouldn't even know how to press a button. Right. And when, when you die, your memories die with you. I mean, it doesn't get transferred. There's no way that as I am at the deathbed, I'm going to just load everything that I, I learned into a disk and pass it over to the next generation. No such thing exists. Which is very interesting because human, with all these machinery, all these complex things, makes so much of a recording of this guest house as much as he or she can, which would be a fraction of what is written, but still, in our entire life, we keep writing and writing. What is it for? So the author is saying that we are carefully recording things, and his explanation in there is it's for wetting. The purpose of that creation was for wetting my appetite and recording is to prepare myself for what will come next. Because as if you are playing this four-minute game, trying to improve your skills in there so that you're preparing yourself to play the actual game, if you would like to take it with the analogy of computer games. This is for you, Adam. <laughs> there will be a pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I think, very important. Like whatever you gain in this life is an experience. If you just look at the, you know, on surface level, it is just being wasted, right? All these experience you have, everything you collected, it just dumped like a trash. Uh, but then author says, and Quran says, no, actually it is preserved, recorded for a purpose. And that, that recording is being taken from two two angles, like one is you as the visitor record, but also you're not the only one that's recording. Like I am recording the creation, but my actions are being recorded from various angles. Like to, to take the most clear one, every single one of you is recording my actions at the same time. Like as if you can potentially betray me in terms of saying that, oh, he did this and that. Like, my actions are part of your recording, which gives me a hint that many more of recordings are happening in this life. Like my actions are not only recorded by you. So why is this bookkeeping going on? So there is this uh, sense of responsibility in life. Oh, any other comments from our uh, online participants? We have quite a few people there. I'm sure you have questions, the parts that you don't understand, don't agree. It is good, good time to raise them. Oh, Suhair, please go ahead. Uh, um you know, it's it's interesting in that, you know, when I think about um, experiences or memories, you know, the to, to take the opposite example of, you know, if, you know, if I were to be experiencing permanence here in this world, there would be no concept of permanence. You know, I, I, I wouldn't have any concept of permanence except through the opposite or transience. And I wouldn't have any desire for the desire also for permanence, except through the sort of um, dissatisfaction with transience. 
not dissatisfaction with how the world is made in that the world is perfectly made so that I may desire permanence, but dissatisfaction with just the temporality of the world. Um, and that's where my desire for permanence stems from. So, you know, the <clears throat> otherwise, if things were permanent, in some sense, they wouldn't have any purpose in and of themselves. If I was just experiencing permanence right now, I wouldn't know anything or desire anything or have some sort of perception of something's meaning except through transience. So in this way, the world is perfectly constructed to reorient my vision or my sight towards the hereafter or you know the eternal abode uh, and therefore to the creator himself. So as Norsi always says, that things look to two things, their creator and their eternal manifestation. So, um, and you know, it's it's because of memory, or I guess you can say knowledge, in that me knowing of things points to, um, which is essentially like a analog to memory. I know, I I, I can re remember things because I know. Um, uh, and I know things because I can remember. And me knowing something by my experience of the world, you know, for example, some pleasant experience I have, um, <clears throat> you know, that's, you know, out in the environment or with other human beings, uh, it's just day to day life experiences. That if, um, me knowing it then also therefore points to and remembering it as Nursi points out in other places, sort of an eternal absolute knowledge or knowing. And so nothing is forgotten and therefore things are permanent. They're permanently known and therefore they have a sort of permanent manifestation. Um, even though I don't experience it per se in this world physically, I can at least experience it by the remembrance of things, the memory of things. Um, that's a sort of permanence, an immaterial permanence that is sort of is, uh, is manifested in this world that a materialist um, cannot account for. Like you can't account for the fact that I can remember something vividly, even though it's not there physically. It, it, it's, there's not possible for matter to account for that. There's no way because matter by definition is, is temporal it's transient so that you know it it's in a way um memory or knowledge is a reminder of for me for the hereafter and so as yusuf was pointing out and therefore to turn my attention towards it, and therefore how i conduct myself in this world um, as he says in the at the end you know without falling into drunkenness because in some sense drunkenness is you forget that's why people drink. They drink to forget, as they say in America, um, because they want to forget, because they are fixated on transience. They don't see the immaterial aspect of the world that points to the permanent abode or the creator himself. Um, and to, to drink or to be drunk is to forget, and to, not, and to forget is to not remember. Um, and so in some sense, you're forgetting the Lord of all things and therefore the resurrection. Thank you. Uh, so, instead of repeat what Suhail said, i like to go to the nine principles, which will, uh, I guess, uh, cover what Suhail said already, that the, we know about the permanence through all these temporary transient things that we observe, uh, but also there's, uh, I guess, this important point. This truth is not only about uh, permanence, but the glory and permanence, right? And the way I understand it is that everything is changing in this life. But whatever comes in place, it has the same glory. So we have a decoration which is a perfect 
a glorious decoration. It goes, a new one comes. It is again the glorious decoration. So the glory is always there and telling us beyond that everything change, there is something constant, the glory. And this constancy tells us that whoever brings all these changing things in front of me must be non-changing himself. Uh, but let's start from the first principle. Uh, we don't have to read them one by one, uh, but just to summarize, uh, he says, you will understand that this world does not exist for its own sake any more than does the, the resting place uh, or rest area. It is impossible that it should assume this shape by itself. So when you look at the life, author says, look at your life. Everything is so orderly. Everything has a purpose. Everything is beautified for your pleasure. Uh, so from the moment you came to life, you come to life, you find everything you need, the like love, compassion, the food, air, breathing, everything you need is there for you. And you say, it is prepared for me, right? It cannot be that things happen by themselves. It's, it is prepared for you. So for instance, imagine you are so sleepy, sleepy, right? Why? Give me a reason, re like a realistic reason why you are sleepy, Adam. Why do you feel sleepy for in this example? Too much Overwatch. Because you did one. Maybe too much Overwatch. Maybe you played okay too much video game. So you are so sleepy, and then you go to your bedroom. You find your uh, pajamas, you know, folded, put on top of the uh, bed. You see the bed sheet, the pillow. You know uh, what is it? Blanket. blanket, everything is there, and your uh, bed is in a perfect shape. That just you know what you need. You put your pajamas on and get in the bed and start sleeping. And you are sure, like a hundred percent sure, certain that your mom or maybe your brother. Your brother prepared it for you, right? You wouldn't say, oh, this is the natural state of things. This is how they, they should be. You wouldn't say that. You would say, oh, thank you, my brother. Even in your mind, like, you don't have to articulate it. You don't have to say it loud. Because, you know, he will be spoiled. You say yourself, oh, thank you, brother. Thank you for preparing things for me. And this is how we find our life. Everything is prepared for us. Everything is there to satisfy some needs of us. Even the lowest needs. Anyway, everything is prepared for us. So it says, you know, there's a purpose in things. There must be a, a creator of things. In our example, it was your brother or your mother. But in the real life, you say, whoever put this tree there for me, the fruit tree, he must be loving me. He put the, the, the tree and the fruits for me. It is prepared for me. So that, I guess this is the first thing that you realize when you look at life. So uh, like when we look at the rest area, we can, like in, in, in our practical case, in a real rest area today, we can say, oh, very nice building. Look at this. It has this modern design and whatnot. Well, I can try to read it as an independent building in the middle of nowhere. But this 
perspective would be very uh, reductionist or maybe pointless because I'm going to be discarding many of actually the real point of the building itself. Because now I'm looking at the building for the sake of building. I'm saying that, oh, it has this sort of a curvature roof and this, it has five doors, like this sort of properties of the building. But if I look at it in the greater scheme, then I realize that, oh, this is right at the boundary between Pennsylvania and Ohio. Actually, this arrest area, this is for people who are starting their journey from all the way from the beginning of another state to the end of another state. So this is in the, oh, then the restrooms make sense. The tables make sense. Everything that picnic stuff, area. picnic area makes sense. So if I look at the rest area for the sake of rest area, as if not even with the name of a rest area, it's just a building in the middle of nowhere. This would be like, I'm just, I will force myself to make sense of things, but I will be losing the real point and I will just wouldn't be able to make any sense. In fact, and this is how we do when we look at the world as if it is the thing itself. Like the worldly life that I live is, this is the point, I just live. And I live only once, so I should enjoy the most. But if I take it as a rest area, I am coming from somewhere, going towards a destination. And the destination is my goal. To, uh, this is why, why I am in that journey. And the, this rest area is for a purpose in here then the meaning totally changes. How I will interpret everything totally changes. So if I take, uh, so the world does not exist for its own sake more than does the rest area. So it's not existing for itself. It's existing for a bigger goal. It's put in there. So whomever is aware of my journey, put that rest area over there. Otherwise, it's not like, Oh, like this land seems to be a good place. Let's put a building on top of here. Just why? What, what, what is this for? And this is pretty much how you would do for business, let's say. You don't simply say, oh, let me open up a food truck over here. Like for a food truck business, if you're going to enter to that, you will be expecting somebody to be eating and then some business place and whatnot. So likewise, what is the purpose of this life that I'm living in here? So in that journey, it has a it has a place, otherwise it's pointless. And why this is important? Like, why looking at the rest area, the rest place, re uh, as a rest place with a purpose and so on and so forth? Uh, why author is giving this example, why this first principle is given? Uh, because I think this is the key to uh, the key to find or know the creator. So uh, let's go to the very beginning of Quran, Surah uh, Baqarah. Uh, do you know it, Adam? The first few verses of Baqarah? You don't have to. Start, please, if you don't mind. No? Okay. It says, this is the book in which, you know, there is no doubt, right? And it's a guidance for mutakin for those who believe in what? What is the first thing? Believe in guide, right? Unseen. So what it's meant there is that you look at the life, you look at the pajamas put on top of the bed. You look at your bed very well, you know, uh, prepared. And you don't see just a bed there or you don't see just pajamas there. You see what? Your brother there. When you look at your pajamas, you see your brother. Brother is, your brother is not in the room. You don't see him, but you see him. Meaning you know that your brother put them there, right? You see something unseen, gaib. That's quite unseen. Yes. <laughs> you see something not in the room, but you can see it. When you look at the pajamas, you see the love of your brother. It's not there, 
but you can see it, right? You say, look at my brother. He knows how much I love video games and, you know, I spend night playing them. And who, who's such a, you know, compassionate, merciful brother, you say, he does not get angry with me because, you know, I overplayed. But instead, but instead, he prepares my bed for me. You see all these things, right? When you look at the pajamas and your bed, you see what? Unseen. Gaib. So this is what human, what makes us human. We can see things which are not there. And with these skill that you have, that you can look at things and you can see beyond what they are. With this, when you look at with such a skill to the creation, to life, you see the creator beyond everything. You look at the fruit tree and you say, Alhamdulillah, I enjoy fruits and somebody put fruit tree for me there. There is somebody who put the tree for me. And this somebody is what we call as creator. Okay, let's continue the next principle. That everyone is a guest. Yeah, when you look at your life and you realize you are not there forever, you are just a guest. You already know that, you know, 13 years passed like a blink of an eye. It was just yesterday, you know, you were uh, drinking milk from bottles like him. So I guess realizing that we are all guests is easy. If you are not, again, drunken, as the uh, author says at the beginning, right? If you are not stupid, you will realize that you are just a guest. You are here today, but tomorrow you will go. And why this is important again? Then you start questioning, like, what is the point of life then? You know, if I am here to live only 60 years, which is like a 60 minutes or even 60 seconds, what is the point of life? There are all these beauties around outside, out there, and I can enjoy only the tiny part of it. What is the point? You start questioning. And when you question, you can find answers. And actually this, we, we can apply this to, let's say butterflies. They say butterflies has one day's lifespan. And then maybe if you have a cat in your house, five, six years, mm. if you have a dog, let's say 10, 15 years. So you do see them as this faster lives happening right in front of your eyes. Why, why were they here? So we keep asking that question for them. Then I, I can also ask the same question for myself. Why am I here? Exactly. And I think with the third principle, very interestingly, then the author says, mm -hmm. you will understand further that the adornment of this world are not for the sake of enjoyment or admiration. Because if they yield the pleasure for a time, they cause pain for a longer time with their cessation. So it's, it's very interesting because this is how we would say, oh, just enjoy or have fun. Actually, it's so much part of a life that I don't believe in that aspect of life, but I was replying to somebody's email. I forced myself not to write, have fun or enjoy your holiday or something like this, like yeah. have fun. What, what does have fun mean? But it become part of the daily language so much so that I just, Put a break to myself not to write that sentence over there because having fun is really just the opposite as the author is saying. If you enjoy it for a, for a few minutes, uh, you are being tormented by not having it for the rest of the moments. Like as if I 
have the uh, Neve Play station, station, right? We are going from these examples today. I have the Neve Play station with like, a, which is a power ho uh, house, right? An extremely powerful machine. I give it to you, but you can only play for five minutes and then I destroy it. You would say that there must be something wrong with this, or there must be something beyond, like there must be a purpose of it. Maybe Brother Birsan was trying to tell me something, right? So I, you would then say that this PlayStation he brought and then destroyed after five minutes must be brought for a reason other than my enjoyment. Because it, it, if it was for my enjoyment, he would let me play more than five minutes. But everything in life are so beautiful, are so glorious, but they're there, again, they are there only for a few, a few minutes. Blink of an eye. Everything you enjoy is there and then it's not there anymore. Your youth. So fun having, you know, uh, being young. And you think that, you know, this youth is given to me to have fun. But then you look at your brother, old brother, you know, no, this <laughs> old fellow, bowling guy who cannot, you know, walk longer than, let's say, 15 minutes, he gets tired. He cannot lift things that you can. And you say, then you must be given to me for other reason, because it will be taken away. There must be other purposes in life. Every beauty disappears telling you the point was not just look at the beautiful things. It was there for other purposes. And then fourth principle, these adornments of this world are like samples of and forms of blessings stored in, up in paradise. So what I understand here is that whatever you see in your life, you realize it's just a sample of something bigger. Because with everything constantly changing, uh, you see the mercy of your mother in one example and then in another example and in another example, but sometimes it's not there. So you realize that there's something called mercy, but I only see, you know, tiny examples of it here and there. <laughs> they are just examples calling for the real one. So what was the fifth principle, I think? You will understand that all of these things, created things, are not for, you know, they're not created just to be destroyed, but that they have a, uh, a higher purpose. So as you interact with things, there's temporary things. Instances of love, mercy, or beauty, all these different samples. And as they disappear, but still the idea of beauty or love is there right. in you. And then you realize that they serve a purpose and they're not just being destroyed for nothing. And so if the, if the memory still exists after the thing is gone, it in a sense is eternal in, in its own way. Is that so this reminds me of how the movies are like if you go to a theater you sit there and imagine they just put one frame of a picture 
and you stare at this picture for three hours. It's not like that, but every like 25 times for every second, a new picture is being shown to you for the three hours of creation. So what is the point? Is the point of changing those pictures is to annihilate them or destroy them or to show you different and new pictures and action, uh, what do they say, action movie or no, action picture? There was some motion, motion, motion picture. Motion picture, sorry, motion picture. So this, this is how the creation is. There's this, it's not like there's this flower and you stare at that flower forever, but it is more like with every stage of the flower, I am being shown something new. And then it's initially a small seed, then becomes a flower, which blooms, opens up, and then starts dying and goes away, and a new one comes. So this transition, like a motion picture, what is the point of this motion picture? Is it to annihilate, or is it the destruction? Or the point of destruction is to renew and to show more to what my appetite, to what's up and coming. It's not a destruction anymore. It's a motion. Mm. It's a great example you gave. So, so mean the flower is a part of a bigger narrative, like a story is being told. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's a story being told, and story is not is not told by each instant, each frame. It is told by changing frames, like in a movie. Do you know how movies are made, Adam? Like there are, uh, uh, I guess the, the norm is 24 frames per second for cinema, for movie theaters. Every second, you see 24 different image. They are displayed, that's okay. They are displayed so quickly from one frame to another frame. It's only uh, 24th of a second. As they change, you see a story. So it's you could look at the individual frames, the images, and say that, oh, every one of them are destroyed. But author says, no, they're not destroyed. They uh, fulfill their purpose and leave the stage for the next image so that there will be a movie. Uh, through their motion. And observers of that movie in the theater are recording it. Like if 100 people were in the theater watching that movie, now there are 100 recordings of that movie, so it's not really destroyed. Like all these scenes have passed, but it's now in the minds of 100 people. So it's Multiply by 100, nothing is destroyed, actually. So, and in the uh, example that he gave, all the visitors were recording what's going on in that guest house. So guest house is being renewed, but is it being just wasted or destroyed? Nothing is being wasted in this sense. There is no waste in the creation, as long as I see the purpose of creation as this instruction. It is being recorded in various forms. And then with the sixth principle, author says, also your actions are preserved, recorded. Whatever you do, there is always a consequence, right? Uh, so as if the, the entire nature recording your actions and giving some consequences in front of you, as if like every law, physical law, that we call, and authors uh, do a great job uh, changing our understanding of the laws in the text. He talks about uh, different type of laws. But anyway, if you look at these uh, so-called natural laws of nature, what is it? Natural laws, uh, natural laws, the physical laws, and so on. They are as if telling that, you know, every action is recorded so that the consequence, the uh, effect, will be generated. Uh, so you do something bad, and what happens? The slap of your mom visits you, right? 
that's your hi. You know, I'm here for you. <laughs> or it's uh, what is it called the slipper, like you put on, yeah, the slipper of your mom. You know, uh, you have a guest <laughs> coming to you. Oh, uh, so everything you do as a consequence, everything you do is recorded, preserved, and you feel the sense of responsibility with every action of yours. So starting from the beginning, then the creation is, is well formed for you. You feel like a guest in life. When you look at things, you see that there is a purpose beyond everything. I can see beyond things. I can see the guy unseen. Wherever I look, there is a purpose beyond what I look. And then uh, through their change, through their motion, they tell me a story. Everything are, is like I record everything and then my actions are recorded. So the purpose is everywhere. And then author continues, you will understand further that the destruction visited upon beautiful creatures of summer and spring in the autumn is not for the sake of an annihilation. Again, with destruction actually comes renewal. And they all together tell you that there must be an hereafter. Everything is renewed. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a goal. And when you say, I am annihilated, I am destroyed when I die. But then you realize that, oh, no, no, nothing is being destroyed. They serve a purpose. So my death will be serving a purpose as well. Just like uh, the all the beautiful things which seemingly dies after uh, summer and autumn, they come back. I will come back as well, you say. And also in, in here also says, it's also a form of emptying in order to clear a space for the new creation that is to come in the following spring. And uh, again, if we go with the motion picture, and uh, you gave the example from theater, but we are not as cultured people to go to like the uh, real theater. Oh, you mean, okay, okay. So for the uh, movies, let's say, uh, if you think about, yeah, the uh, one of the actors were killed in the movie. First of all, you know that this guy is not really killed. Like he was just, he's dead in the movie. You know that, right? Like the guy. When they die in the movies, they, they don't die. Okay. <laughs> but also, you know that a new, like one of the actors went out so that a new actor will come into the picture. So it's this setup is there to teach you something so this is black panther goes so that you know his uh, sister will continue as black panther anyway. <laughs> so uh this is also it brings us a beautiful way of looking at the uh, existence now because otherwise if it's an annihilation it disturbs but if it is like a replacement of players sort of it's it's a totally different thing now the purpose changes the meaning changes and my replacement also becomes meaningful because this is why it hurts. Like if it's annihilation, it hurts. If it's a replacement, one player goes out for getting rest and a new player comes into the play, World Cup. So uh, then it, it's a totally different perspective. Now. Okay, Alhamdulillah. The eighth and the ninth principle concludes that and it says, you will understand that the eternal maker of this transient world has another everlasting realm. And you will understand that a uh, compassionate a being will bestow upon his choice. Uh, he will, the creator, he will give a new uh, bounties, you know, novel, new, beautiful things that you cannot even imagine in this new world hereafter. Okay, we are out of time now. Uh, let's conclude with beautiful comments or questions of our online participants. I'm waiting for a few seconds. 
to hear from them. And with them, we can conclude, inshallah. Okay. Uh, with her silence, I guess Aishanur says, uh, I apologize for my silence. Next week, inshallah, we will contribute much more. I can read from you know, uh, his name as displayed on participants list. Jazakallah uh, everyone. Inshallah, uh, we will end now. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana inna kanta al-alimu al-hakim wa ahiru da'wahum anilhamdulillahi rabbil alamin al-fatiha.